okay, of uh, aged uh, of uh, of um, general psychology, and also from different perspectives. You heard from some seniors from Autumn. Now you're going to hear from a caregiver. So that's me. I am Stephen Lim, and uh, I had two siblings. So that's my elder sister, right beside my mom, who very unfortunately uh, passed away when I was a freshman in NUS Arts and Social Science. I was obviously very devastated. So this is why we should all keep going for cancer screening, because she, she didn't do that. She didn't believe in that. She believed in Chinese medicine. So in Chinese medicine, if you feel a pain, you think, well, there's something wrong with my qi, with my energy flow, you know? And well, uh, the cancer metastasized and spread to other places and she passed on. And that's me in the middle, and that's my younger brother. Uh, he's an Air Force pilot uh, trainer, so he's based in Perth because we have no space here to fly. <laughs> and uh, that's my dad right over there. So I live at Admiralty. That's near Woodlands, one stop away from, two stops away from Sembawang MRT. And that's where my dad lives. And my dad, he is born in 1954, which means he's about 69. He's relatively young. Unfortunately, he developed cataracts and glaucoma. Glaucoma refers to the increasing pressure uh, which comes with aging in the eyeball that affects the, the nerves. Glaucoma refers to an increasing opacity in the cornea, so vision gets affected. So with this double whammy, his vision is affected, is he? Am I correct? However, uh, this is very treatable, isn't it? You can just get a cornea transplant, which he did. You can always use medication to reduce the eye pressure in the eyeball, the pressure in the eyeball, or even have a little vent. I forgot what's the term called, a little vent to reduce the pressure. However, that was, this, this was just the beginning of my story as a caregiver. I'm the only single person in the family. So I, I live in Sembawang, my sister in Amokyo, and my brother in Perth, Australia. So I'm the only single, I'm a single person. So naturally, the, the caregiving burden fell on my shoulders. And in Chinese culture, it's like, it's seen that, well, if you're the eldest son, elder son, you, you're supposed to bear and shoulder the family duty. So it's a very Chinese thing, very Confucianist thinking as well. Okay, and uh, over here you may ask, who are these people? Oh, that's my sister, her two, her two daughters, my brother-in-law's older brother with one girl, and that's, yeah, that's my brother-in-law's mother. So this is all I have my family. So my father was an only son. Here, my, grand, my paternal grandparents came from China at a time of uh, great uncertainty, you know, near the end of Qing Dynasty, uh, you had all these issues and, and he was seen as very precious. He was taken care of very well. He was seen as the one to carry on the family line, okay? Uh, and that uh, he must have sons, okay? So all these were in him. And what happened was that uh, it actually bred in him, um, I would say a very interesting personality. And since this is a psychology module, I'd like to give you a first-hand glimpse into uh, how upbringing can actually affect a person from generation to generation, and how it also affects how caregiving is carried out. You know, I, I, was, I was joking to Prof Wayne just now that I could make this into a, a movie, you know, or write a novel out of this, because there's so many twists and turns that are very interesting. So for the past one year, I've been scurrying from place to place. There is no one single place in Singapore that can treat the many, many issues. Now, the first place you see on the left side, top right, top left, is the Institute of Mental Health, because he has some mental health issues, which is namely depression and generalized anxiety disorder. <sighs> then he has the eye issue, which is where the center is. And then third is the polyclinic. Uh, for, for some of you who are not from Singapore, you un, uh, maybe you understand polyclinic is for general ailments, like uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, you know, things like that. And there's an ambulance because he did call for an ambulance once to, to, to take for a hospital, which was a symptom of his uh, mental health state. Uh, personally, I'm very, having worked in health promotion board previously, and I, I even ran campaigns on HIV AIDS and mental health, I find that um, uh, the understanding uh, uh, of mental health and psychological health is not good in the older population. Okay, so what happened was that um, I found that this uh, GAD, general anxiety disorder and depression, uh, actually accelerated had there been no COVID-19, had there been no pandemic, okay? Because during the pandemic, he was, uh, 
he was at home most of the time and uh, uh, he couldn't do many things and it was isolating. So you, I'm sure for all of you uh, who did Psychology 101, you know this model, the diathesis stress model. Mental health issues is exacerbated by difficult situations, including the pandemic, or an economic downturn, or an earthquake, or some difficult times. And so we will see, you will see here, you do some research, you'll find that the rate of elderly suicides has gone to all time high, uh, all time high, so has youth uh, mental health issues. But of course, another hypothesis is that people are becoming more aware. So kudos for the campaigns, that people are seeking help. But uh, I believe in strongly this model that had there been no pandemic, uh, we could have uh, maybe a few more good years. Uh, <clears throat> uh, meaning, I, I wouldn't say, <laughs> Uh, then I wouldn't have so much burden at the moment. So it's, it's a very personal thing that I'm experiencing, but I, I just want to share with you my personal difficulties. So uh, there was one night, uh, it was still the pandemic, and uh, his GAD, his anxiety disorder, got triggered. Uh, so at 1 a.m., he couldn't reach me because I leave my phone on silent. So uh, he called my sister, and uh, he insisted to do this. And I, I thought I should just share this with you so that you, uh, it's better for you to hear. Uh, so this was the first phone call, then the, the subsequent phone calls got more and more and, and, and anxiety laden. I'll quickly translate, it meant uh, uh, my sister's name, uh, I can't see, my eyes hurt, I need to go to the hospital immediately, I need to get ambulance. Oh, by the way, he was obviously charged for the misuse of ambulance because you don't do such things. Uh, so this is a sign of general anxiety disorder. Everything is catastrophized. Uh, and he was stuck at Kutek Port Hospital and I couldn't see him, and uh, in the end, they discharged him with just some eye drops. Yeah, so this is one example, and wasted a lot of time and energy as well. So, um, when comor comorbidities, physical and mental health come together, right? Uh, the person may project that the physical ailment is bigger than, than, should be, than objectively is because of the mental health issues. Uh, and, and so this is a very classic example of that. And then they gave me so many medications. Oh my goodness, I, I could not make sense of it, okay? I, I think I became a pharmacist overnight. <laughs> um, so we tried all means. The doctor thought, hey, could it be your testosterone, uh, you know, uh, what we call andropause? Uh, uh, all men will experience that. Uh, it's a male equivalent of menopause. So they gave me a sialis. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and then there was this fluoxamine which is a SSRI, and apparently if you stop taking it, then you can get giddy. Then there were other things that you say, you cannot take too much of lorazepam, it's a benzodiazepine, it can get addictive, so don't let him do too much. Oh, but never mind, if he takes too much, you try Zopicon, okay? You help him get to sleep, it's not addictive. And then, oh, there are 10 different eye drops. And I don't know what the middle one is, it is uh, pro progabalin, it has something to do with uh, Psychosis, I don't know. So I'm just being laden with, I have bags of medication. Well, well, it's, it's just a lot of medication. I have like a box of it. And then they change. And I go there and do stop taking once in a while and throw it away. Yeah, I, I was seeing too many physicians and they all had their own opinions. And anyway, the medicines are subsidized, except for some things like sialis. Sialis is not subsidized, huh? Okay. And some expensive eye, med, eye, eye drops are not subsidized as well. Under MediSafe, MediSafe, uh, like our health pension, huh? okay? Ah, so eventually, things got really bad and we had, he wanted to kill himself. He said, um, Pei Tong, that's my name, could you bring me to the block, uh, the highest block in the neighborhood which has 20 something floors? And I, I think I'll jump down. Uh, so uh, he had to therefore go to IMH. And uh, at that time, there was not enough space. So he was put in a crowded ward he hated food there. He didn't like to be in a general ward. And later on, it emerged, he said that he didn't try to kill himself. So, my, me and my siblings hypothesized that this is actually not a real, uh, call, uh, real intention to, to do, you know, but more for attention. 
yeah. So here's a clip uh, that will actually explain it as well. I know it sounds a uh, uh, yeah. Okay, let's let's see what what he says. So this is a conversation between me and my doctor, and I, I really wanted to share this very honestly and vulnerably, because uh, uh, nobody will understand. Uh, I will not say nobody. It gives you much clearer understanding of the complexities of caregiving, especially where comorbidity, comorbidities of physical and mental health comes together. So I said, uh, you have depression, you know. Uh, then he said, well, you, everyone is accusing me of that. Oh, there you go again. Okay, so because he was very unhappy in the ward, the next day I, uh, I had a chat with him and I took the opportunity to record a voice clip. He said that, well, I'm not like that. I'm not like that and uh, uh, don't, any, don't accuse me, okay? Please don't accuse me. And he was very unhappy. He said, I want to get out immediately, <laughs> which of course they don't allow. Because under Singapore's laws, if you had told a pro medical professional that you want to kill yourself, they can retain you, I think 72 hours, Three days, three days, three, three days. And... I try not to respond because uh, knowing his uh, rather entitled sort of a personality, the more I react, the more I fit into that. So there's a slight manipulativeness sometimes, attention-seeking uh, behaviors here. Uh, which I have become very conscious of. Sometimes I find that it really helps me if I, I've, I'm reading, a, I'm looking at this situation from a more omniscient point of view, like as if I'm reading a novel or watching a movie, and it helps me to see the, the objectiveness of it. Because if I react, it will, it, will, it will just upset everyone further. So that's why I have silence here. Yeah. At this point, he's staring at me. Yeah. How? How? He's trying to <laughs> say, you better do something. I don't want to stay inside here. <laughs> okay, so this is what the IMH experience is like uh, in, a, in a general world. And IMH is short of space, very, very much, much short of space. And also, we are very short of nursing staff. So one nurse, can you see here, has to sit over here, vantage point, and he has to watch over 10 or, or 15 people. Oh, yeah. Okay, so this is, uh, then later we got him into a geriatric ward, which was much better. Obviously, the ratio of nurses and nursing aides to patients is much lower because geriatric patients are more likely to fall. Am I correct? You need feeding, they have risk of choking, right? They need to be, uh, 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 they need diapers. So it's called a sun, sunshine wing. You see, it's so much nicer. I shouldn't, actually, uh, uh, all, all these photos are not authorized, but I just had to sneak in a, a couple to share with my siblings that it's actually better. So they feel better as well. And this is their activities. You know, it's, it's very interesting. And I, I felt like this was a little bit highbrow for many of the uncles there because they, they couldn't, <laughs> I, I don't know whether they had this level of cognition, you know, to understand mindfulness or, uh, I don't know, identifying emotions. I, I'm not very sure about that, but uh, I, I like the fact that there were activities. Okay, so there's something you do. You know, you sit there the whole day. You're so bored, you know. Can you imagine that? Okay, so there was uh, something I wanted to share, which is a stigma and discrimination, which, uh, by the way, my dad would have never gone to IMH on his own. Uh, I, had to, I had to make him go there because uh, there's a lot of internalized stigma and discrimination and also, of course, all around. On the taxi to IMH, I said, Uncle, uh, we are to IMH, uh, Ban Chao Yi Yuan, uh, Woodbridge Hospital. Uh, oh, oh, what's that, what's that, what's that? Uh, it's Hokkien dialect for uh, mad people's house. Uh, they said this kind of thing. <sighs> you know what I felt at the moment? I felt like, you know, you are the kind of people that act, you are the kind of people, uh, uh, ignorant, uh, that makes it harder for your friends to seek help, you know? Because they, they, they will feel this kind of comments from you. They will not seek help. They will not admit to it. You see? So this is one example. 
I also you you heard my dad. Don't not let him Don't anyhow say I do this kind of thing. And he also said, don't tell people where I'm hospitalized. Okay, keep quiet. Uh, don't tell the neighbors. Okay, uh, just say I went to the hospital for a, a, a rest. Uh, so you see the internalized stigma and discrimination going on there. Uh, for me, I shared with some people, but some of them didn't understand. One one church brother said, he looked at me like. He couldn't process it, like, your father want to kill himself? Well, I said, well, that's a normal symptom, very common symptom of depression, but he gave me a look that, mm. and I realized, oh, he, did, he doesn't understand. I mean, depression, is, it, it affects one in 10 people, doesn't it? It just manifests in different ways. So, ah, so that was a form of othering. Now, I, um, it's a philosophical concept, but I felt like it happens a lot. It feel, I feel like it happens a lot in caregivers, healthcare professionals, and friends and family. So when they couldn't process the fact that my dad wanted to kill himself, right? They, they gave me a look that I knew was like. So same thing is uh, when my when pharmacists. So I'll share with you uh, this term called elder speak. Okay. Uh, so I, I experienced a lot of it uh, in the course of my, especially in IMH, you know, of all places. I think they are very very tired. I believe the staff that are very strained and exhausted dealing with such uh, complex patients. So uh, there was one pharmacist who, you know, uh, here and here only. Uncle, ah, 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 this drug, ah, you have to eat at night three times, ah. But this drug, ah, you can't eat too much. Ah, if you don't sleep, ah, if you don't eat, ah, if you don't sleep, ah, you can't eat too much. Okay. So the, the features of such talking is infantile. Increased volume, there's an affectation. And she, she doesn't make eye contact with him. Of course, my dad uh, was, uh, he didn't really react. <laughs> but I'm very sensitive as a communication scholar. I, I mean, I, I think somebody should do a study on this, on elders speak in Singapore and, and how healthcare professionals have no idea they are doing that. And she does that. And she's, she's um, and I, I put myself in her shoes. I think I can understand why. Because they are not responding, right? So if you don't use this kind of uncle ah, the tai bo ah, they ah, you don't use of they they think they cannot hear. Actually, they can hear. So, so I felt like it's not just about the practical difficulties of poor hearing, or language difficulties, or even knowledge. It's really an othering. You are diff you are not my kind. That I realized that there was a. <laughs> there was an important invisible. You are not as human as I am. I'm going to share with you uh, a, a, a voice clip that had this. Okay, this <clears throat> this happened uh, at 11 p.m. So again, my dad uh, called me. Said, "Ah, uh, I'm not feeling well. I'm really, I'm really tired. Ah, too too hard to work. So I said, "Ah, I'm going to call you." So we went down to E and E. Give me a moment while I open that file. Oh, no, this is not the one. So this is a junior doctor on duty because uh, this kind of slots are very difficult. You are going to see people who are drunk, who are addicts, who have schizophrenic attacks coming in at uh, past midnight. So this is pretty junior. And uh, it's a lady, and she does uh, elder speak to a lesser extent from the example I demonstrated early, earlier, the pharmacist thing. That day I really uh, was at a window uh, thinking of jumping down. Please note the change in affectation, intonation, and uh, pitch, okay, in the voice. So I keep going. So there 
it's a sense of, uh, as you hear this, you say, well, in the past, I used to be able to see and I, I put eye drops, I'll be able to get along my daily life. So there's a grief going on. Unable to accept there's a loss of a very vital function. <laughs> Yeah, last time I used to be able to take out my phone, it was very clear and now it's all very blur. ECT refers to uh, putting electric currents through the brain to help restore the chemical imbalance for depressive patients. No, I was less so I would say, well, how do you use So trying to ascertain whether he really did it, did he really open the window, did he put his feet out, uh, uh, all this kind of thing. Uh, did he open the window grills? Um, note the difference, okay? And uh, it's funny, you know, sometimes he talks, he, she talks to me to ask very specific questions because she thinks that he can't really respond. But actually, you need to give him time and patience because he's not dement he doesn't have dementia nor is he below uh, the normal IQ. So this is just one of many examples I've experienced uh, and most prominently in IMH. I, I feel like this has a correlation to the stress they feel, the experience, the frontliners uh, with patients like of this nature where you can't be exactly sure what they are saying, what they mean, and they can be very emotional or maybe even aggressive, yeah. So uh, I know it can be upsetting to hear this, I'm so sorry, but uh, this is uh, the reality and I want to give you a, a, a feel of it. But there, there is, um, so many a times I find that the doctors uh, are the central node, you know. Okay, so uh, later on, <laughs> I wanted to top up medication. I thought I could do so through health hub to SG and I'll pay and then you deliver. No, the pharmacist said we need a doctor's approval. And <laughs> it's not a benzodiazepine kind of drug, you know, it's just <sighs> need to see doctor. Okay, fine. December holidays, right? So I couldn't get a doctor, never mind. And then I wanted to get a referral to a daycare center so that he has more social interaction. Need to find doctor again. The social worker said doctor has to endorse. <sighs> Okay, go for a specialist to see something, uh, go for another specialist doctor, need doctors and It's like everything falls on the doctor's shoulders. It almost as if the social workers or the, I, I had to be frank, I felt like the social worker would have had enough expertise and knowledge to be able to say whether I should make a referral or not. And the pharmacist should have, definitely has enough knowledge to do so as well. So it's like very doctor centric. That's what I realized. Everything you need a referral from doctors. So, but uh, uh, here's how I, how, how I cope uh, I, I, when I talk to people. I, I felt like on t at times, uh, I try to take a little bit more of an omniscient point of view. You know, like as if I'm writing a novel. Not that I don't care, but I see it like, oh, 
So here's the actors at play. Oh, here's the dad, here's Steven, here's the siblings, here's the doctor, here's the nurses, the pharmacist. Let me look at it uh, from a stand part and look at it a little bit. And, and that helps uh, for me to remove some of the bias, not 100%. Of course, I got to get emotional, you know, all that, yeah, but, <laughs> but it helps a lot. Uh, rather than me seeing it only from purely my own point of view, you know. And I, I thought that works very well. I, I feel like this is also something that I wish my dad uh, was able to. I suppose uh, we call this metacognition, right? Thinking about how you're thinking. Oh, my dad doesn't like to do that. He doesn't really do that anyway. So uh, he can't go for therapy. He can't go for psychotherapy or counseling. Uh, there's no way I can. So, we call it "no medicine can save." In Chinese, uh, it means no medicine can save, right? But also another meaning is like <laughs> sometimes it feels very futile, right? Yeah. So, how do patients get this omniscience or metacognition? It's something I, I, I don't know. Does it have to do with education? Does it have to do with some intervention or a certain way of motivational interviewing or therapy or counseling? I have question marks about this. But you guys, as psychologists. Maybe you want to think about it. Very interesting point. Yeah. Because it doesn't come naturally, now I realize. Like in children, they don't, they don't do that, you know? Uh, and a lot of older adults don't do that as well. Oh, well, I want to share with you good news. And I'm very grateful, despite all these things that have happened, I am very grateful to be in Singapore because there are lots of uh, uh, care, uh, uh, lots of, not say care, uh, uh, safety nets available. So uh, unfortunately, as you see, this kind of thing uh, cannot, because no matter connection, uh, right? no omniscience, then how, how do I, how can he talk about his situation? He will continue to be very narcissistic, so to speak, in his uh, worldview. Yeah? So uh, thankfully, we also got insurance. And thankfully, I got two other siblings, because if you were me alone, oh, I don't know how I'm going to do this. And I'm, well, consider white collar. If I'm blue collar, uh-oh. And if I did not, you know, go to university or, or go to graduate school, maybe I wouldn't even be able to cope, you know, using a certain, uh, certain approaches to see the situation. And wow, I'm very happy. I used, uh, I mean, it used to be the IMH, oh, sorry, uh, Institute of Mental Health, a lot of things are not subsidized. Now it is. I'm so thankful. I think it's a, a one step forward to destigmatizing and reducing discrimination against mental health illness, which is like any other common chronic illnesses. Why should we discriminate against that? But one step forward could be two steps back because there are people who will say, uh, I'm H, I sell on King, uh, uh, met people's house. Huh? Yeah. Okay, so well, if you're interested to know more, you can also contact me uh, if you have any questions for me. I, I know I've uh, kind of exceeded my 30 minutes, but do we still have time for any questions? We do have, yes. I'll be very glad to answer. Um, as with any human library, we ask questions to help us 
understand the phenomenon, the experiences, however personal, right, that is described, that is disclosed, that is related by the books, uh, which speak in a very active and in a very, um, um, in a very active fashion. So yeah, so I want to invite questions uh, from students to Stephen. Uh, they may be facts, they may be personal thoughts that Stephen may have, or they may be connecting uh, connectors between some facets of his sharing and some of your, your, your learning in this course thus far. Right? Recall that we have taken two approaches in this course. First, the biopsychosocial model, and second, the critical gerontological model of understanding Yes, hi. Yes. Thank you. Uh, my question is, what do you think is the biggest learning lesson that you have uh, My biggest lesson is compassion. Um, let me explain. Uh, and I'll be very honest. My sister and my, and my younger brother, they, they're not Christians, okay? Nor do they have that uh, I studied some psychology in US and I did some courses in between so they couldn't make sense of it uh, nor could they could, nor could they do this very well nor could they do so they, they felt hey uh, wow <laughs> uh, yeah they were very upset so uh, they scold him on <laughs> yeah I, I don't react because I know he's ill, uh, but they. One oh, here's a quote from my sister. Yeah, he's only sixty-nine years old. My mother-in-law, uh, eighty plus years old, you know. Oh, she's so different. She made a comparison. So what I've learned is, is to consider the pers where the person came from. You know, he he is also probably a victim as well. Uh, because when I look back at the background, I knew that he had a turbulent childhood. It was a time of poverty. There was addiction involved. There was family violence involved. And many issues. So I think this is the biggest lesson to take away is to put yourself in another person's shoes and consider uh, not just him at this point in time, but what was he like as a 10-year-old, maybe 5-year-old and 15-year-old. And, and that helps me make sense. See him as a broken child, just like I perhaps am also a broken child. And then I realize, hey, we're in the same boat, and we're all broken in the same way. And you know, I'll, I'll be alright with that. Uh, it's just a short while. We, we we'll get through this. Yeah. Thank you so much for your question. And yeah. Oh yes. Hi there. I don't see it as a society thing. Let me explain why. Uh, I do farming. Uh, uh, can I say a bit ago? You're under this organization called Hope Worldwide Singapore at Ling Kwang Home uh, for seniors. So we started a farm there. So if you're interested in agriculture and go and join us, I have observed the care, the nursing aides. Uh, they don't do that kind of thing. You know, they won't say Auntie ya, what? Auntie, ah, ah, da jie, hey, 吃饭了，啊，啊，啊 ，come sis, come and eat already, and it's the. They don't do that kind of loud volume or childlike affectation. So here, I think it's the root issue. Do you other? Do you other? What, what do you mean by that? Like, do you like as a pharmacist day in day out, you see all kind of chaotic patients. You're working from nine to five. Then, of course, I can understand why you other. If you're a caregiver, you know, and my sister and my brother-in-law, uh, my younger brother also other. Uh, a very telling quote from one of uh, my conversations is that he. 为老不尊，为老不尊。呃，是成语，是 idiom。Chinese idiom means that 
as an elder, you should be wise and respectable, but yet you are not. So it's like you're judging him already, isn't it? And when judging, you're othering, isn't it? So I feel like it's very hard, you know. Sometimes for caregivers, huh, to even realize they are in that situation of I'm othering as a coping mechanism, or I'm othering because of my background, cultural background, and my own biases, or my lack of education, or my refusal to empathize, or my fam, or I was abused by him, which some actually we were. I grew up in a very <laughs> tumultuous family, so I know I, I can understand why they felt that way. So, I, I think one, one, one good thing would be start let healthcare professional and realize, hey, you're, you're doing this other ring, you know, you shouldn't do that. Eh? You have to be detached, you know. You're a professional. Forget caregivers, give them a break. They are there 24 7. But you, as the pharmacist, you shouldn't talk like that. You, as the emergency room doctor, shouldn't talk like that. You are demeaning the other person. The person feels less than adequate and actually has, I feel like, it will make the person less trusting of the system. And then you're going to call the ambulance more often. They're going to ask more questions. They're going to um, be doubtful. They don't want to come for appointments. They may miss appointments. It has cumulative long term effects, you know. Uh, like, you don't respect me. This is a Xiao King, you know, then it reinforces their thinking. But that's a great question. I really appreciate you for asking that. Yeah. Oh, yes, hi. I think the time. Oh, well, guess what? My sister did say that uh, since it's so much of a trouble, and by the way, this is taboo for me, you know, that in Chinese you say, huh, uh, you don't air your dirty laundry. Every home has a difficult book to read. So if you say you're going to send your father or mother to the nursing home, it's like abandoning them, right? But she didn't understand the system. In order for you to get into the nursing home, you need to have one ADL. ADL stands for activities of daily living, toileting, changing clothes, eating, uh, he has all of that, so he doesn't qualify. And then, remember, I wanted to do the elder care thing, a, uh, the, a daycare center thing. Uh, doctor centric, the doctor takes so long to do everything. Plus, the fact is, then I went to my uh, a nearby center at Kampong Admiralty, uh, and the person said, it's not that we have lack of space, we have not enough drivers to, for the van to bring an escort. Uh, okay? So, uh, the maid. Well, actually, this is uh, well, I, I don't mind you. I don't mind saying like, uh, we, we, there's a maid uh, but it's not higher under my name nor my father's name. But since she is at Amokyo, which means from Lantau, from Lantau to Sambawang, uh, from Lantau you take the TL to Woodlands to Sambawang is doable. So she comes once a week with the cleaning. So we did discuss. Shall we get a maid? Then. Here's the question, who's going to supervise her? And will she be able to handle his demands? Uh, so, daycare seems to be the best choice intermediately. And I'm hoping and crossing my fingers that a, a slot will open up. Uh, because I can't be bringing him to the center at 8 and then bringing him back at 9. Uh, not possible. Uh, uh, no, no, not 9, 6 p.m. So, um, Somebody said, "In guo bao ying," you know, like something to do with karma. You know, like uh, whatever uh, you reap, what you sow, sooner or later you go in. Some of them are hoping for that. I know because it's like the easy way out. Yeah. So, well, when it comes to formal care, it carry it is actually very. You have a lot of guilt. You have a lot. It's a lot. Of, emotions involved in it and it's not so simple as it seems actually yeah but thanks thanks for the question yeah feel free feel free yeah oh yes sure hi Ah. Oh, yes.
Mm. First and foremost, have to be have to have self care. Um, many women in Singapore, I realize they are very giving and self sacrificing. It is a, a, a adherence to a traditional a role that has been. It's unspoken, but it's like. Uh, you know, nan zu wai ni zu They say women must take care of the domestic affairs, then men go out and uh, earn the money, uh, bring the bread home. <laughs> yeah, but this is a lot of what Chinese people think. I, I don't know. Uh, for our eth other ethnic groups, I also see that many ladies are homemakers, so so they may take on too much. They need to know that what is too much, oh, and then they, they, they need to have that self care. How do you do that? You got you you have to uh, find a support network. I I, I think it's very important. Uh, uh, so Prof Chong is one of my support network uh, persons. There are many, many, many others. That's important because it's like how if you're a therapist, you also need to get therapy yourself, right? So that's one thing, self-care. And I think that self-awareness that what is your limit and boundaries. Uh, thank you for sharing that with me there. There are some things that is not in your... It should not be in your realm of responsibility, nor is it in your control to change. If he is grieving over his loss of eyesight, there is no point saying, uh, keep nagging and nagging. Uh, it's irreversible, we can't change the cornea, um, uh, please accept it, uh, don't keep repeating it, you know. Uh, we accept it as it is. So sometimes you just accept and then realize there's something that you can do, then we do. Mm, boundaries, self care, support network. And I think there needs to be a better education. There are many places you can go to it. Not just daycare centers, there are senior activity centers as well. Oh, I went to check out Home Age. There's also, uh, oh, oh, let me share a very interesting thing. I, I also found many, many interesting services. One is called Medical Escort. Because I'm, I'm busy as well, right? So second thing is he, he said he can't, he can't see, he doesn't, he doesn't go out to get food. So there's this thing called AIC, Meals on Wheels. Okay, two meals a day, lunch and dinner brown rice, a vegetable, a protein, and a fruit. Very balanced and very, very, very affordable. Uh, the Swami Home sponsors some of it because they get a lot of donations. MOH, I Ministry mean, of Health sponsors some of it. So it's like, I don't think a lot of caregivers know about this. Like. They really don't. I, had, I mean, I, I, will, I'm a, I love Google. I'll just go and Google and, and read out. And you know, Prof Chong used to be in EIC then. He also gave me some links. Yeah, so it's like, I feel like there are many caregivers who feel like they are stuck in the hole of their own and they didn't realize there are so many resources out there. They don't have to cook all the time. They don't have to be sending the patients, uh, the, 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 the person all the time to the home. They, they, they can put him at a senior activity center nearby. Uh, there are befrienders as well, alliance befrienders. So you can have an hour or two of reprieve. But I don't think many people know that. Yeah. There's a silver direction on AIC website, but I don't think, I don't think so. So they do know how to do that. I mean, if they don't know how to even Google, then how do I expect them to go to AIC civil pages? <laughs> yeah, but thank you for your question. Yeah, so there's, there's certainly a socioeconomic SES divide uh, between how, yeah, for caregivers and how they utilize resources. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, I hope it's useful. Yeah. This is very useful. You complement our learning. It's great, yes. Yeah. So uh, let's take a five minute break. Come back by 5.35 and go for the slides. Okay. okay, thank you all for your time. I, I have got to make a move though, because my dad, yeah. Okay. Thanks, huh? Okay, see ya.